Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you, and wherewith shall I make the atonement that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord. And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver, nor gold of Saul, nor of his house, neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What ye shall say, that will I do for you. And they answered the king, The man that consumed us, and that devised evil against us, that we should be destroyed from the remaining in any of the coasts of Israel, let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul whom the Lord did choose, and the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because the Lord's oath, because of the Lord's oath, which was, uh, that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. But the king took the two, sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, whom she bare unto Saul, Armani and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she b brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzilla, the Maholathite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord. And they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of barley harvest. And Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock from the beginning of harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day nor the beasts of the field by night. And it was told David what Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, the concubine of Saul, had done. And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son from the men of Jabesh Gilead, which had stolen them from the street of Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hanged them when the Philistines had slain Saul in Gilboa. And he brought up from thence the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son. And they gathered the bones of them that were hanged. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan his son buried they in the country of Benjamin and Zela, in the sepulcher of Kish his father. And they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God was entreated for the land. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. And Ish... Uh, Ishbi Banab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob, then Sibachai, the Hushethite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jair Origem, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet again a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. And he also was born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. This is the word of the Lord. Be Please be seated. And let's pray before we jump into the text. Father in heaven, we thank you again for this time together. Uh, we thank you for the privilege it is to worship you uh, on your holy mountain. We pray that you would bless us with your word now, uh, by your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we kind of have to switch mindsets. We've been working through First and Second Samuel, which is a narrative portion. So typically, uh, and we've seen a couple rifts in this where there's kind of a flashback or a story told in multiple chapters from different perspectives. Uh, and so in that sense, not purely narrative, as in, you know, you go to the next chapter, you're going to have the next story. Uh, here we have, uh, some people refer to it as kind of an appendix of sorts, uh, however you want to label it. This is not in chronological order. 
So chapters 21 through 24 are the, is the final section of the Samuel narrative, First and Second Samuel, and it's not, we're jumping out of chronological order, so don't think of this as happening on the back end of, of Joab slaying Amasa and taking over the army again. Uh, it's more, more of a flashback than that. So we concluded that narrative at the end of, at the end of chapter 20. So we have here in chapters 21 through 24, uh, it's, a, it's an appendix, but it's very intentionally organized. The beginning of chapter 21 and, the end of ch- and most of chapter 24 both deal with plagues brought about by sin, uh, which you know, are then uh, only, uh, those plagues only cease when uh, repentance is had. Uh, or sought by the people of God and the Lord relents. The, the center of this, so it, chapters 22 and 23, the center of this appendix section uh, feature a psalm by David unto the Lord and then his last public words uh, to the people of Israel. Not his final words, his final words, uh, we'll see as we move into Kings in, in our Bible study, uh, will be to, to Solomon, but these are his pi- final public words that we'll get to in a couple weeks. So the events described in this chapter are not telling of the same event even, uh, but of a uh, sort of historical survey of events during David's reign. In the first part of our text, we have the recounting of how David made restitution for a covenant that had been violated with the Gibeonites by his predecessor to the throne, which was Saul. So Saul was on the throne before David. He mistreated the Gibeonites. We'll look at that more shortly. And then this, and the first half of our text is focused on David making restitution for a wrong that Saul had committed. The second half of the chapter, we have multiple stories, four stories, of giants being slain by David's mighty men. All right, so the first half of our text, in terms of a theme, uh, stresses the importance of keeping covenants and making restitution. Right? Restitution is a biblical category. Keeping covenants is essential. It's the foundation of our hope because God is a covenant-keeping God with us. And the second half of the chapter focuses on the need to build a culture, or at least look at uh, a culture that had been built and the fruit of a culture that had been built of giant slaying. David wasn't the only giant slayer in Israel. He had built a culture of giant slaying. And so we see uh, this account of his men uh, following after him. So let's look at verses 1 and 2. And there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered, it is for Saul and for his bloody house. Because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal. Feel free to put that word in quotes. Zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. So again, this is not not in chronological order. So at some point in David's reign, at some point in his reign, we're not told exactly when, uh, he has to deal with this famine in the land. It goes on long enough that he doesn't think it's some... uh, passing thing. He thinks it's a judgment from the Lord, so he inquires of the Lord, what's the, what's the purpose of this? Why is this coming about? And he learns that it's because of Saul and, note this, and his bloody house. I think that's really important. Saul and his bloody house is why this judgment is upon them. Saul had, we read, slain the Gibeonites. Now the Gibeonites were Canaanites, and you might remember their name from Joshua. So back in the book of Joshua, back in chapter 9, uh, Joshua is supposed to wipe out all the Canaanites, right? And these Gibeonites trick him into making a covenant with them. And so Joshua makes this covenant and he winds up enslaving them, but he doesn't kill them because he made a covenant with the Lord. And even though he, you know, they got the best of him, he's not going to go back on his word because that's the importance of a covenant before the Lord is that you honor it. Joshua took that seriously. And so though he makes them uh, drawers of water, uh, among other things, hewers of stone, drawers of water, which may give us a hint as to when this took place, uh, they make a covenant with the people of God and they're safe from being wiped out because of it, at least in Joshua's day. So I mentioned the drawers of water. One possibility of when this took place would be, uh, if you remember back to 1 Samuel 21, when uh, Saul goes and kills a bunch of priests uh, in Nob, right, Ahimelech and other priests because they helped David. Right? They helped David to flee and, and fed him. Uh, it may have been, that may have been when this occurred. But whenever it was, Saul violated the covenant that Joshua had made. Saul violates this covenant that was binding on all Israelites to not kill the Gibeonites. And he did this, again, in the name of, quote-unquote, zeal. Zeal for the children of Israel. And this is nothing new for Saul. If you remember back to when we went through the narrative and, and looked at the character of Saul, uh, there's multiple occasions on which his, quote-unquote, zeal uh, causes him to go in direct opposition to the law of God. 
right? He's waiting for Samuel. Samuel delays longer than he thinks he's going to uh, in offering sacrifices before this battle. And so Saul takes matters into his own hands. Why? Because he's zealous. He's not going to go forth without offering this sacrifice to God. Never mind that it's against the direct command of God as to who's to offer that sacrifice, right? And so that's his quote-unquote zeal. We see that zeal here as well. There's, not, there's no true zeal for the Lord in uh, passionately dishonoring his law for circumstantial blessings for them, right? Because Saul wanted to wipe them out. He wanted more power. Uh, he wanted that land. He wanted to establish uh, his kingdom from that land, and so he seeks to wipe them out. Right? Even a zeal proclaimed to be for the people of God is objectively sinful when it leads to a direct violation of the law of God, plain and simple. Right? You cannot be short or rude or mean-spirited toward your spouse when they fail to carry out some form of discipline with your child to hold up their word. Right? Returning fit, sin for sin is usually how we handle conflict, if we're honest. We return sin for sin. We feel justified in returning sin because we were sinned against. But a true zeal for the Lord, well, I did that because of zeal for the Lord. You disobeyed the Lord's command, and that just bothers me so deeply. A true zeal for the Lord looks beyond personal slights and frustrations and seeks to uphold the law to bring reconciliation, to work for and to glory in the truth. To work for and to glory in the truth. Right? God's law is gloriously consistent. Gloriously consistent everywhere, including on this point. So we're not going to find any such loopholes where you can have a zeal for the children of Israel and Judah as you break covenant, a covenant made before the Lord. And so, this quote-unquote zeal from the Lord, what's the, what's, the, and what's the production of it? What does it produce? What does it bring forward? Does it bring forward blessing from God? No, it brings forward a famine. That's what this zeal for the Lord produces, a famine. And so that tells us the type of zeal it is, a zeal that Saul had for his own name. And all Israel suffers for it. Right? The, more, the more authority you have, the more responsibility you have, which is a blessing from God, something he entrusts to you, uh, the bigger the consequences when you fail. Right? The sin of a father is going to affect the whole family. The more kids you have, the more, right, which are a blessing from the Lord, blesses the man who has his quiver full of them, the more kids who are affected by that sin. Right? More authority, more responsibility, greater blessings, greater curses. So look at verses 3 through 9. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement? Right, so this is, think, this is atonement language, right? Making atonement for, for this sin. That ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord. And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver nor gold of Saul, nor of his house, neither shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What shall ye say? Uh, what ye shall say, that will I do for you. And they answered the king, the man that consumed us and that devised against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coasts of Israel. Let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give him. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. But the king took two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, whom she bare unto Saul, Armani and Mephibosheth, different Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillah, the Meholathite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord, and they fell all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of barley harvest. So a few things to notice here. From verse 3, we see that David is willing to pay the Gibeonites restitution. What shall I give you? That's how he starts. What shall I give you? And, and notice in this whole thing, uh, I wouldn't read into David's motives at all. The whole thing results in uh, God relenting on the famine. So what David does here is commendable. Right? He, does a, he does a good job here. So he's willing to pay these, this restitution. Restitution for wrongs committed is a biblical category. That's a biblical category. It's in direct opposition to the way that most crimes are handled in America today. Almost all crimes. Uh, I've probably told the majority of you guys this story, but there's, a, there's many that could be uh, cited from my time working as a police officer. One occasion, we had a guy, likely very high on methamphetamines, 
uh, going around Pacific Beach, which is a, a beach town in, in San Diego, slashing tires, just one tire per car, because he liked the sound of the air coming out when he, when he hit them with his knife. And, you know, by the time somebody saw him, called us, we found him, got in a foot pursuit with him, it was 30 cars later. So 30 cars with at least one flat tire. And what's, what was the fruit of that? So here we get this guy, he's arrested, he's in the car, the, the community's safe now, but there's a problem, you know, all these people are going to have to go to work tomorrow, and they all have a flat tire, and so I'm going door to door, taking pictures of these cars, notifying the owner, hey, your tire was slashed, and they'd say, well, what's the next step? Well, he's going to go to jail, he's going to be treated like an animal, put in a cell, you're going to pay for that, you're going to pay for his meals, you're going to pay for the new friends he's going to make, they're going to help him to be better, a better criminal, uh, pay for his, his free gym membership, to get stronger for the next time he has a fight with those trying to enforce the law. And uh, I would go to a tire center because he's not paying for any of it. He doesn't have the money to pay for it and he's not going to have to work to pay it off. So, so justice for those people looks like seeing this guy treated like an animal rather than treating him like a human being made in the image of God who now owes money to all those people whose tires he slashed. That would be justice. If he doesn't have the money, then he can have a supervisor who can help him to work to pay off that debt. That would be justice. These people would receive uh, restitution, right? They, they've been wronged. Uh, they're out, and they shouldn't be responsible for the, the financial uh, hit that that is to each of them. But, but that's the system we've established because we have a system of, rather than restitution, we have a system of rehabilitation. Right, it's the government's job in, in America. The government sees it as their job to rehabilitate these people. A job that belongs to the family, that belongs to the church. Right, these people need to repent of their sins. Turn to Jesus. Right, they need to hear the preaching of the gospel. They need to know what it means to work hard with their own hands. But we have a system of, of rehabilitation. So the government takes that on themselves. Uh, and it is a train wreck. All right, what's the fruit of not obeying God in this, of trying to take the government trying to take on more than simply the responsibility they have to bear the sword, such that criminals feel uh, a fear about disobeying, that there's going to be a legitimate consequence that they're going to have to pay, not that somebody else is going to pay for them. And where you know, citizens in a community feel like they're protected uh, from these criminals being able to do whatever they want with very little consequence. All right, we get lifelong criminals. That's, that's one of the fruits of it. Lifelong criminals and taxpayer-funded institutions honing their craft. We treat men like animals. We fail to protect the property and the rights of citizens who seek to uphold the law. But David, again, understands restitution. That's a biblical category. He wants to make things right. And so that's what he inquires at uh, with the Gibeonites. And inter interestingly enough, and this is commendable, there's some things that the Gibeonites do here that are very uncommendable when we see how they leave these bodies hanging uh, for months on end. But here, uh, some very commendable things by the Gibeonites. They're not interested in being paid off. They don't want silver or gold from Saul's house. Money is not, is not the answer for them. Right? They're not giving out their Venmo handle like BLM activists today. Right? Yeah, I mean, if you could just throw me 10 bucks, that'd be great. Slavery. Right? They don't actually, those people don't actually care about justice. Right? If they cared about justice, they'd, they'd, just have, they'd have a higher standard. Goodness gracious. Right? They don't want silver or gold. The Gibeonites also do not have any interest in punishing, it says, uh, random Israelites. Don't just kill a random Israelite because Saul punished us. That wouldn't be just in their eyes. Right? It was the crimes of Saul in his bloody house. They aren't burning down a random business for undefined injustices having nothing to do with that business or its owner. No, there was one house they cared about. There's one house they cared about. It was the man who sought to wipe out the Gibeonites from the earth. That's how the Gibeonites describe it. And that was the house of Saul. And so they request seven men from Saul's house to be hanged in Gibeah. So David provides the men, but we see that he spares not all Mephibosheths, but one Mephibosheth, uh, the son of Jonathan. Now what David's doing here is very important because he's not only restoring a covenant that was broken by Saul with the Gibeonites, but he's also maintaining the covenant he kept with Jonathan. Again, in the name of zeal, he's not breaking one covenant to uphold another. 
This judgment comes from Saul breaking a word that he should have upheld. Right? If you do not have your word, if you do not have your word, if people cannot trust what you say, then you ultimately do not have anything. Better to swear to your own hurt than to say something and do otherwise. Better to swear to your own hurt. Which is a reminder to be uh, slow to commit to things. Right? Expect it to take double the time that you, you know, you account for it. And, and, and therefore, you know, hedge your bets in terms of what you're committing to. So that you can be a man, a woman of your word. Right? If this is not the case, we have nothing. And this shows us more clearly the evil of not keeping our word. Right? Of promising one thing and doing another. You should keep your word because God, what's the fundamental reason we should keep our word? God has kept his word to us. Has he not? God has kept his word to us. Being a man or woman of your word ought to be the fruit of gratitude for God's faithful word to you. You are secure in Jesus Christ. He will not leave you or forsake you. What are you saying about those types of promises when you're not true to your word as a person, a man or woman of God? Right, a part of his body. But these men are hanged. Seven men from Saul's house are hanged. And so it's considered the justice uh, of this action. It's an interesting thing. Uh, you read a lot of old commentators and they'll say this was a, just a special occasion on which David was given basically license to go beyond what the law allowed uh, in, in killing these men. Right? And the assumption there is Saul sinned individually. And so, and so Saul individually sinned, right? Deuteronomy uh, chapter 24, verse 16 says that a, a son should not be punished for the sins of his father. And so how can these seven sons, or seven descendants, uh, be hanged righteously? Some people just trump card. God told me he could do it outside of the law, but it was good because God gave a special decree in line with that. That's, that's one interpretation that's given. But one strong possibility is that whatever Saul did to the Gibeonites, he did not do alone, and these individuals had a hand in it. And maybe that's why the Gibeonites wanted vengeance from Saul and his bloody house. Saul and his bloody house. Another explanation that's given a, a third a third way is uh, you know the Gibeonites use this language that is reminiscent of holy war language. They say that Saul sought to wipe them out from the earth, right? And that's that's holy war language, just wiping the people out in totality. Uh, and so, in response to that, David gave a, a holy war response and killed seven of their men. I don't think that interpretation holds up because we see Mephibosheth spared, we see women spared. None of those people would be spared in a holy war type context. And so I think what makes the most sense is that the seven men who were hanged had a hand in whatever happened to the Gibeonites. They were responsible for it. They had guilt in the matter. And so it's not an exception to the law of God, but it's in line with the law of God. And that's what we have here. They took part in Saul's wicked works, and this hanging takes place, we read, in Gibeah of Saul. And it takes place in the springtime. Continuing the text at verse 10. And Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock, from being uh, from the beginning of, of harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven, and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. And it was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, the concubine of Saul, had done. And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son from the men of Jabesh-Gilead, which had stolen them from the street of beth Shan, where the Philistines had hanged them, and when the, Philistines, uh, when the Philistines had slain Saul in Gilboa. And he brought up from thence the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son, and they gathered the bones of them that were hanged. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan his son buried they in the country of Benjamin and Zela, in the sepulchre of Kish his father, and they performed all that the king commanded. And after that God was entreated for the land. So again, the Gibeonites, positive things to see, negative things to see. Uh, they certainly had a leg up on the BLM rioters of our day, but do not make the mistake that they were righteous. Right? They might have had some good standards, not wanting gold, not wanting random people dying for the crimes of Saul's house, uh, but they were not a righteous people. Right? Just in their initial demands, but here, go beyond what is right and how they treated the men who were hanged, how they treated their bodies. 
Right? They leave these bodies hanging from spring to the following fall. This caused Rispa, the mother of two of those hanks, two of the seven, to set up a tent of sackcloth in front of the hanging bodies and to protect them from scavenging animals. I read multiple commentaries that said she is a, a Hebrew Antigone. My only experience with Antigone was not from mythology, which I had to look up, but from uh, a, a children's series where there's a, a female character named Antigone, so I had to look that up. Uh, but you know, she was in Greek mythology, she, I think it was her brother, family member, a relative, uh, which died and was, you know, wasn't going to be given a burial. And so she went outside of what was the quote unquote law to give, uh, to give that body of her family member, uh, a, a proper burial. Uh, and so Rizpah, this was an original thought. Rizpah is a, a Hebrew Antigone. Could, can't miss it in the text, but she, she does. I mean, think about the pain this would be as a mother. Uh, again, I don't think there was a violation of justice. So her sons got what they deserved for violating a covenant of the Lord. Uh, but now she has to sit there uh, before them in a tent of sackcloth, uh, keeping birds off of them, keeping scavenging beasts off of them by night. Doesn't leave a lot of time for sleep. Probably extremely painful to see them, and yet uh, a submissive woman in that she does not uh, go against God. Right? These bodies are offering an atonement of sorts for this violation of the covenant. And so as hard as it was for her, she doesn't pull the bodies down. Uh, but waits patiently until David finally takes action. Um, but horrible thing to have to go through for a mother. Un unimaginable. All right, so she's protecting them day in and day out. When David catches wind of what Rizba was having to do, he took the occasion to gather those bodies, as well as, on this occasion, the bodies of Saul and Jonathan, which were not at home in Kish, uh, with Kish, but instead uh, out in the land uh, of the Philistines. And so he brings this, these bodies back. They receive a proper burial, and the famine ceases. The famine finally ceases. And before moving to the second section of our text, it's always worth noting, wherever we see it, that God is the one who brings famine. God is the one who brings famine. Right? God's not outdueled by the devil whenever calamity strikes. It's not yin and yang. No, God brings calamity. He brings judgment, and he uses them to his perfectly good and holy purposes. All of them, every trial, every calamity. Our duty in times of trial is first to evaluate our lives. First move is not, I'm a victim. First move is evaluate your life. Is there sin that's bringing about this situation? Is God seeking to wake you up? And if there is, then repent. Repent of those sins wherever you see them. But either way, bless the name of the Lord in every season. Right? That's our duty when trial comes, is to bless the name of the Lord. Certainly evaluate our lives. Don't just consider yourself a victim. But when you've evaluated your life and you say, okay, I, I, don't, I don't have any sin that I'm pers like purposely harboring for myself, refusing to confess to God, refusing to confess to one I've wronged. Okay, God has brought this calamity, and objectively I know if he's brought it, which he has because he's sovereign over everything, then it's for my good. He's working for my good in this. And so I have a duty not to be bitter, not to be angry at God, that's sin, but to rejoice. Even when we can't see the reasoning. Even when the situation confounds us. There's just no understanding it. Knowing that the Lord's sovereign over doesn't give, necessarily give you profound understanding as to why you're going through what you're going through. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't give you a key to understand everything. So we must trust the Lord and we must bless his names. We never have grounds for anything else. And so like Job, that's where we rest. Verses 15 through 17. Moreover, so this is the sec moving into the second half of our text. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. Remember, again, this is a flashback. Don't think chronological. This is a, a flashback into an earlier period in David's reign. And Ishbi Banab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, sought to, uh, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. And the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go uh, no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. So whenever this series of battles take place with the Philistines, uh, they're likely in the latter part of David's reign, a time when David's no longer fit for battle, such that he's not the giant slayer that we see anymore, but going out to battle and 
you know, having a little bit of a close call. Right, the focus of this section is not so much on David's lack of ability, though, as it is on the strength and abilities of the mighty men. The strength and abilities of the mighty men. The first story recounted on this walk through what's basically, you can think of it as like a, a hall of fame, right? great works done by the mighty men. Right, Looking back at these great works, reminiscing. First one is, uh, mentions Abishai killing uh, Ishbi Banab, a giant of the Philistines who almost took David's life. Now it's easy, you know, after the last few encounters we've had with Abishai, it was at the, you know, we're in the narrative of 2 Samuel and it's towards the end of David's reign and you just get this vibe of uh, Abishai being kind of rash. Uh, all of his suggestions to David about killing these men get thrown down and David's exasperated with him. It's easy to think of Abishai as simply just an overzealous man, doesn't bring a lot to the table. Why is he always next to, why is he always at David's side? Well, that, you know, we need to have a balanced view of, of who these men were and what they accomplished. Uh, he's the man who saved David. Why is he at his right hand? He's the man who saved David from this giant, slaying him himself. So yeah, he was an overzealous guy. Also had great skill, great courage, bravery in battle, a great ability to fight. And so he's by his side for good reason. He had preserved the light of Israel. Right, David's described here as the light of Israel, preserved by Abishai through his work. Verse 18, And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then uh, Sibachai, the Hushethite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. So there's another day, not the same battle, another day in which Israel fought uh, or found itself rather warring against the Philistines. And on that day, a son of the giant, Saph, was slain in battle. The death came at the hand of Sibachai, the Hushethite. Yet another mighty man from David's army. Verse 19, And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jair Origim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Now a note on this one, because you'll, you'll get a few interpretations on this. Uh, some take this to be a reference to David himself. Elhanan being a reference to David himself. Uh, and that's because some manuscripts don't include the portion, uh, the brother of, before the name of Goliath. So it says, this man Elhanan slew Goliath. We know who slew Goliath, that was David. Right? These interpreters must also therefore say that uh, Jair Origim is another name for Jesse, because that's David's father's name. Right? So you'd have, to, you'd have to assert that both of those are the case. Uh, the ESV and many other translations will not include those words, and this is why uh, some take this to be a reference to David, uh, who was the one who killed Goliath. So that's a possible interpretation of this text. Uh, but I think, I think clarity is brought when we look at a cross-reference of this event, uh, the work of a man named Elhanan, who is also the son of a, of a Jair. In First Chronicles 20, verse 5, it says, And there was war again with the Philistines, and Elhanan, the son of Jair, slew Lamai, the brother of Goliath the Gittite, whose spear was... Uh, whose spear staff was like a weaver's beam. So we see uh, Goliath has a brother who was a giant, who was slain by a man named Elhanan. They both have a similar spear, like a weaver's beam. And so I think from the sounds of that, we have our guy. Now it could be David. Either way, you have either David or a man from David's army slaying a mighty man. Right, A third mighty man, a third fallen giant. And concluding our text, verses 20 through 22. And there was yet a battle in Gath. Where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes? In case you can't add that up, four and twenty in number. He was, and he also was born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, Shemaiah, the, the brother of David, slew him. And uh, these four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. The final mighty man of 2 Samuel 21 is Jonathan. This is David's nephew. His foe was no less than the other Philistine men mentioned, and his end was no better. Right? All, the giant, all were giants of Gath. All fell by the hand of David and his men. David and his men were giant killers. They were giant killers. This was David's reputation from an early age, and it was an example he set for his men. Similar to the theme that we saw last week with wise women in the Bible crushing the heads of evil men, we can see a theme of giant slaying throughout the Bible. Not just in David's time, but throughout the Bible. Who led the rebellion that led to the flood in Genesis 6? Was it not the giants of the earth? What did the Israelites in the wilderness witness when they first spied out the land of Canaan? Right, the spies go to look at the land that God has promised them that they will inherit. 
They saw a land that ate the inhabitants thereof. Right? They saw the sons of Anak, which come from the giants in Numbers 13, 33. The Israelites felt like grasshoppers compared to them. That's how they described it. Grasshoppers compared to these mighty men. They were supposed to conquer that land, but the inhabitants terrified them. David is remembered among those Israelites who did not fear such foes, but fe- feared God instead. Right? That's part of David's legacy. And because of this, David uh, not only was David a giant slayer, but his men were giant slayers. He discipled them into that. Just as godly, ungodly fear breeds ungodly fear, this boldness and confidence in God that David exhibited rubbed off on his men. Right? It marked the mighty men. So giants were part of the story through the Old Testament. But all of it was not for its own end. Of course, the purpose of these pictures was to point forward to Jesus. And this is what Jesus says in Luke 11, verses 21 and 22. It says, When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. Jesus is the strong man. The one who stripped Satan of his armor and thrown down that giant serpent. The people of God are giant slayers. We are to be giant killers as we follow Christ, who is the ultimate giant killer. And there's, a, there's a popular cr- clip from probably three or four years ago now. Some of you may have seen it. It was an evangelical pastor in Texas shouting at his congregation. There's this beautiful gospel-centered exhortation that they are not David. You're not David. Right? He, he screams at them. And everyone, everyone cheers. Right? And this is commonplace where the idea of being quote-unquote gospel-centered leads to an understanding of morality that does not allow you to see examples in the Bible and follow them. Right? Seek to follow them. But part of spiritual maturity, part of growing in grace, is being able to glean everything we can from characters in the Bible and apply their examples to our lives without thinking that it therefore becomes our source of righteousness, what we, what we do for God. Right? Jesus, being the only grounds for our salvation, which he most certainly is, does not make him cease to be our greatest example. He's both. He must be both. You, have a, you must have a category for walking in obedience in your Christian life. Right? If preaching the gospel, so what's being said there basically, you know, you're not David, is, you know, your job is not David. David's a type of Christ. You're to look to Christ. Don't try to follow after David. Look to Christ. Well, how about both? How about we look to David as he is a good example, as a type of Christ, as we're trusting in Christ for our salvation? Right? If preaching the gospel becomes equated with never talking about good works and actually following Jesus, then it's not the gospel that Jesus preached in the Great Commission. Right? What about teaching everyone to obey all that Christ has commanded? Those who say foolish things, like the idea that Jesus is a good teacher, right, a good example and not the Messiah, do not realize that they're calling him a liar and a fraud. But those who call Jesus their Messiah and refuse to talk about his example, right, as a pendulum swing for these people who only want to talk about him as an example, are missing something vital as well. You can't have both. In fact, you must believe both. Right? If you're trusting in Jesus, he's your savior. There is no other Savior. There's no other way to be saved under heaven but by Jesus Christ. His perfect life for your sinful life. Right? He paying the penalty for your sins which you owe to God. God accrediting His righteous life to you by nothing but faith. Having life forever in the power of His resurrection from the grave. That's the only way to have salvation. Right? Jesus is your salvation. He is your righteousness if you are trusting in Him. But Jesus, as your Lord, calls you to live a righteous life, and he wants you looking to him, to his example, as you seek to do so. Right? What does it mean to love your enemies? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. What does it mean to honor your father and mother? Look to Jesus. And also, we can look to types of Christ, like David, and model them wherever their actions are commended. Right? What does it look like to wait on God's timing? Look at David in the wilderness. Look at him time and again having opportunity to take the throne by his own will, chopping off Saul's head, and where he waits on the Lord. Be like David as he was in the wilderness. What does it look like to face your enemies? 
Look, to, look at David and look at his men who followed his example. Take on the giants with confidence. And we sang the Son of God goes forth to war this morning. And this song is all about this concept of looking to Christ and to his faithful followers as our example. Right? Praying to God through song that we would have grace to do the same. To be like them. This is the last verse. A noble army, men and boys. The matron and the maid around the Savior's throne rejoice in robes of light arrayed. They climbed the steep ascent of heaven through peril, toil, and pain. O God, to us may grace be given to follow in their train. Giants are part of the story. Just as trials are a part of the story, giants are a part of the story. They're there on purpose. And do we have giants today? Are there people telling you to give up on discipling your children? Give up on even having them. Are they telling you that you do not have the right to educate them, to discipline them? Are there people telling you to forget about faithfulness to your spouse? Are you being told, even threatened, to leave your convictions out of your everyday life? Are there men who would delight to strip you of your livelihood and make you de de dependent on government assistance? And do these people have seats of power? Do they actually have the ability, not just this evil desire, but the ability to affect you and your family through their dictates, to punish you for your disobedience to their unjust laws? Well, yes. That's what makes them giants. Not just the evil desire, but the power to carry them out. There are wicked men in high places, men who hate that many of you want to have a bunch of kids, men that want the destruction of the Christian church and the Christian family. From another angle, thinking about these giants, are there sins in your life that have held sway for years? Sins in your life that have held sway for years. Grown to be an opponent that feels just too great to conquer. It's just too much. It's too mighty. Jesus is the giant slayer. Crushing every opponent that sets themselves up against him. Conquering the sins of his people through his death, burial, and resurrection. No other solution. And you don't need another. There's no sin for any of God's people that escaped being nailed to Jesus' cross. And so don't be fearful of a land full of giants. That's the setup. Right? That's God's pattern. That's his plan. Imagine being those Israelites, right, spying out the land of Canaan. God promised you the land that you're beholding. You can see it. And he promised it to you. But you can't take your eyes off the sons of Anak. You have to guard him. The giants are overwhelming and they're everywhere. But God has promised you the land. That's where we're at. Jesus has established the new heavens and the new earth. It's established. You can see it here and now. This is the land. And he's promised all of it to you. Right? Jesus has ascended to his Father in heaven. He's on his throne at his right hand. He's ruling and reigning. This is his land. He's inaugurated his kingdom. He's promised us the earth, and so we should look out on the lands, not ignoring the giants, and have utter confidence that the day is ours. He does not send you out alone, but he sends you as a member of his body. Remember that Satan will be put under the feet of the church. You do not look out alone. We look out as a body. You look out with the universal body of Christ on the land that will be ours, that Jesus will subdue. As we encourage one another in this type of disposition, we will breed as David and his men did, more and more holy confidence. Right? Holy confidence begets holy confidence. Trusting the Lord, not our own strength. Gosh, that would be depressing. The Lord's strength. Don't look at the giant and dwell on your own lack of strength. Look at the giant and think about the power of the great giant slayer, the mighty serpent crusher, the Lord Jesus. He is your strength and your shield. He has not only taken the armor from the strong man. But he's clothed you with the whole armor of God. Not only has he dispossessed Satan of his armor, but he has clothed you in the armor of God. And so the exhortation is to put it on. Put it on. You're clothed in his righteousness, equipped with the gospel of peace, which is the way this world will be conquered, through the gospel of peace. You have salvation as your helmet. You have the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You are commanded to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of this is yours when you do so. Giants all around. Why? 
that make for great stories. Make for great stories. So put on the Lord Jesus Christ and follow in the train of him and all his faithful. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that the task before us, the task of seeing this world subdued unto your name is far beyond our abilities. To our shame, not even consistently what we want to spend our lives in. But we pray that you'd give us more gratitude for being your children. More gratitude for the work of Christ in our place. More gratitude for the work of the Spirit continuing to sanctify us. And a desire to see this world subdued to your name. To see more and more of your enemies turned sons and daughters. Help us in this work, Lord. Uh, bring about your kingdom through this church, through the faithful churches, uh, proclaiming your word this Lord's Day. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.